Okay, I think that uh, we can start. I would like to welcome you at the last session of the first day of the WIRE conference. Today we had the opportunity to discover and discuss uh, different policies and instruments through which uh, regions can utilize innovation in smart ways for uh, creating, uh, for creative ideas, for growth, for addressing societal challenges. During this last session, we go a step further and we are going to discuss about open data. Data that results from research, from research activities, or a data that come directly from the regional authorities or governmental authorities. And in fact, they can um, reveal new patterns, they can lead to new services, to new products, they can boost the competitiveness of SMEs, as you will see in some very practical examples but also they can increase the transparency of the regional governance. In our panel, we have representatives of different stakeholders involved in the open data initiatives. We have uh, representatives from policymakers, from uh, the academics, and also from SMEs. So without further delay, I will pass the floor to Professor Iveta Gutakowska, who is a professor and director of the Library of the University of Latvia and also Open Access National Point and manager of the Open Air Project in Latvia. Good afternoon. I hope you are not very tired. Open Air 2020. It is not a new project, and certainly many of you already know this project very well. The open air from 2010 becomes structurally large and complicated with serious intention into legal entity. But this means uh, that each project partner doesn't have the opportunity to cover a whole because operating a system of experts. Latvia's representation in this project since its beginning, when we started to talk about open access and its infrastructure in the field of science. The University of Latvia is one of the 33 national open access desk units that carry out information activities. Latvian researchers are active participants in the open access week activities, consultations, regular trainings and webinars. We talk to policy makers at national and institutional levels. It is important for us to promote the project guidelines and offer support services. On the screen you can see the functional structure of the project, but I would like to note our progress. Two major open access institutional repositories created by the University of Latvia and Riga Technical University. There are also some others, as well as operating disciplinary repositories. Repository of the University of Latvia is open for smaller institutions too. Included publications, dissertations, scientific journals, digitized publish publications, using open air network are, ava are available in all scientific world. We still have a very serious homework, be carried out, combine repositories into a national infrastructure. There is a solution, creating a national science portal by initiating a Ministry of Education and Science. And of course, more active use open air platform for common creating integrated scientific information system. You 
in practice, Latvian scientists agree with benefits of open data sharing for scientific research development. Many of them do not use these opportunities in practice. Our scientists learn more from open science experience gained by the projects in collaboration with researchers in other countries. I am sure uh, that there would help some encouragement and motivation, and of course, national open access policy and their implementation rules at national and institutional level. Latvian challenge to encourage open access to research results, publications, and integrate repositories of scientific institutions and museums, archives, and other cultural, educational, and research institution network. Storage of digitized materials and make the, their integration in the international open access infrastructure. This will be ensure the availability of wide range of information resources for reuse outside the country in which they are made. The European Commission started in 20 well, a process supporting open access in publicly funded scientific research. This is information also uh, we give from uh, open air platform, and this is material for our consultations and training work. Open air helps to understand and build an action plan, and very concrete action with Horizon 2020 Open Data Pilot. Research, let, research data openness to the current Latvian scientific community is a huge challenge for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that uh, the Open Air Project is a very successful, has been a very successful initiative of the European Commission since uh, 2012, I think, and we can see through this example that it is not only an, is an initiative to coordinate um, activities and policies between member states, but also to initiate and to provoke changes at the national and regional level. Uh, we are going uh, to proceed now. There is a, a slight change in the order. We are going to, to continue with uh, Mrs. Zvetanka Kalfin, uh, Program Officer in DigiConnect in the European Commission. Uh, she will present us the, the policy environment for the open data and the opportunities that we will see in the coming future for all of us on the open data sector. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely pleased that I have been offered the opportunity to present today the objectives and the concrete plans of DigiConnect with respect to research and innovation. For the purpose of the discussion today and tomorrow, I will concentrate my presentation on the policy context, the way in which infrastructures can support open science and innovation, and what are our challenges ahead. I will reveal in front of you our plans for the work program 2016-2017, which is still in the process of inter-service consultation. The objective of the European Commission is to optimize the impact of publicly funded research, both at the European level and at the level of the member states. Uh, the instrument at the European level is Horizon 2020, and this is essential for Europe in order to enhance its economic performance and to be able to improve its competitiveness through knowledge. One way to get there is through open access, 
which means results of publicly funded scientific research to become very quickly disseminated to the benefit of researchers, industry, and citizens at large. Open access can also boost the visibility of European research, and it can be very beneficial for industry, and especially for small and medium-sized enterprises, by providing them access to the latest results of the scientific research. Uh, and we are really happy that we have projects like Open Air, which implement and strengthen the, our policies. The aim of the open science is to transform science through ICT tools, networks, and media, and to make research more global and close to society. Digital technologies are reshaping the practice of science, and the next generation of high-performance computing infrastructures drive more powerful modeling and simulation. The improvements in high-speed network capacity make access to information easier and more affordable. And open science is the logical thread which links all these pow powerful developments. The importance of open science for building a data economy has been recently recognized by the Digital Single Market Strategy which was approved uh, recently by uh, the College of Commissioners and which will become a coherent framework for unveiling the benefits for creation of a digital single market, which, as all of us know, is one of the 10 priorities of Juncker President. The e-infrastructure is a very complex ecosystem and it consists of different stakeholders with very diverse needs. Scientists, industry representatives, infrastructure operators, and policy makers. Scientists need to perform best research, and for that, they need access to the best possible research facilities. In order to survive, industry needs to be competitive. It can be achieved by leveraging on the know-how and knowledge and by developing and testing new products and services. Infrastructure operators also need to provide best service to their customers and constantly to evolve and innovate. Policymakers are interested in innovation and scientific discoveries. And from here, from this diversity of needs, comes the challenge in front of us. How practically we can address all these needs and how we can ensure sorry how we can ensure sustainability innovation and data exploitation the tool in our hand is the work program 2016 2017 which is constructed around three major themes the first one integration and consolidation of the infrastructure platforms the second one, which is uh, more relevant for the purpose of the uh, conference, prototyping innovative infrastructure and services, and the last but not least, support to policy and international cooperation. Sustainability. It will be tackled by uh, introducing service lifecycle management and coordination between European Commission and the Member States. If the researchers need a service which is not still available, and this need has been, um, uh, has been brought to the attention of the infrastructure, this service could be developed. Once the service is mature enough and recognized by the scientific community, then it can be integrated in the catalogue of services which the respective infrastructure provides. And on the other hand, the service which is not anymore used can drop from this catalogue, and ideally a new one which better, more efficiently and effectively meets the needs of the clients may be introduced. The innovation aspect. Infrastructure platforms and services need to evolve through innovation actions, 
And this can be done by two main types of activities, platform-driven infrastructure innovation and user-driven infrastructure innovation. For platform-driven infrastructure innovation, it's the platforms themselves who are in the driving seat who develop a service on their own initiative. What is more interesting and appropriate for the present discussion is the user-driven innovation, which means that the users of the service, they team with the infrastructure platforms and they together co-develop and uh, uh, introduce a new solution. There is an increasing demand on research infrastructures to contribute to the development of modern European data economy. So far, the main focus of the European-funded scientific infrastructures have been on academic and research organizations and institutions. Industry, and especially small and medium-sized enterprises, somehow, became, uh, uh, somehow remain distracted from uh, infrastructure providers. How to overcome this situation and how to involve industry and particularly SMEs? For that purpose, we have created a special topic, which will be included in the next work program, which stimulate innovation potential of SMEs, means that SMEs may become grant applicants. Uh, SMEs may be involved either as a provider of service or user of service. Uh, if they develop a service which on itself became mature enough and is recognized by the scientific community, this service can be incorporated in the catalog of services. And as a user, SME may use the infrastructure in order to develop their own products and services for further commercialization. In order to reach the SMEs, we will use the innovation clusters. They are located in the regions, they speak the language of the SMEs, they know the, what types of SMEs are in the region, so logically, they will be used to disseminate the objectives of the call and the benefits for the SMEs as well as to target the potential SMEs as grant applicants. We expect to have a proposal and to have a creation of a consortium with representatives from the e-infrastructure platforms, innovation organizations, and software vendors, which then will be responsible for launching calls of proposals and uh, evaluating the proposals granted by the SMEs. Uh, the budget allocation for this topic is 6 million euro. It will be launched in uh, beginning of 2016. And the individual grant per innovative factor is expected to be in the range of 100,000, 150,000 euro. So these are our plans. Now it's time to work really, and from now on we will rely on you and your involvement to make all this happen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think that it is clear that in the immediate future plans of uh, DigiConnect, there is a clear role for regions and uh, a way to boost uh, their SMEs, the involvement of their SMEs through their innovative uh, clusters. And uh, I, we, we saw that in the topics, we identified the quadruplets helix, which we heard before. We can see the, the involvement not only of the research, but also the industries, the, the citizens, which is something that has been discussed uh, quite widely since uh, in this uh, first day of the conference. So now we pass to more practical examples of, um, of open data and uh, regional activities on open data. I would like to invite Mr. Sverker Holmgren, Director of the Nordic eScience Globalization Initiative at Nordforst in Sweden, to present uh, an example from the Nordic countries. Thank you very much and thank you all for, for being here listening. 
So what I will do is I will present uh, some more concrete actions on open science and also uh, some future plans in the context of the Nordic region. So that is the five Nordic countries and the independent areas of Åland, Faroe Islands and Greenland. So this is a region uh, consisting of several countries and some independent areas, a uh, total of 25 million people. And I will do that as a representative of uh, Nordforsk, which is a facilitator of Nordic research collaboration uh, under the Nordic Council of Ministers and governed by the different research funding organizations in, in the Nordic countries. I will talk a little bit about the national activities by giving one example, uh, and then I will focus more on, on the overall Nordic activities. So, I'm standing here representing uh, an organization that facilitates research. So, I will talk about uh, scientific data. Uh, and in terms of scientific data, there has been quite a lot of discussion on how to make sure that they are openly accessible and what are the issues, of course, with, with this. So, you might recognize some of, of the reports that are on the screen, that's on the screen right now. Uh, Actually, one of them, uh, the one in the middle there, the gray one, is also about access to public data. But I think in, in general there's been a lot of work when it comes to open access to scientific data, maybe not so much when it comes to public data. Uh, when, it, then, when we talk about researchers and uh, access to scientific data, many researchers still have some doubts. So first of all, you have the sort of very immediate reaction, those data are mine. Oh, then you can try to explain that these data, those data are actually funded by public means, so maybe it is a good idea to have them publicly available, and usually there is an understanding for that. But there are other issues that are complicated to deal with. Uh, of course, there needs to be a reward system for researchers, so if they provide data in an open access way, they have to be somehow rewarded for that. Uh, there has to be some sort of possibility for quality assurance of data and also making sure that data is used in the right way and so on. The discussion on open science and open access to, to research data has progressed quite far. Uh, it's gone uh, to different stages in the different Nordic countries, but I pick out one example. So uh, Finland, we all look at Finland uh, as, a, as a good example here. There is a ministry-led uh, initiative on open science, and the goal set by the ministry in Finland is that they should be leading in openness of science and research by 2017, which is tomorrow, basically. Uh, there's a sequence of implementation projects that ho have already been completed. There is an open science roadmap that was published uh, last year. And there is an established e-infrastructure for actually providing uh, open access to, to research data. I think it's important to, to understand also that the underlying meaning of, of this example in Finland is that they want to stress the role of research as the foundation of knowledge and know-how, and which then promotes sustainable economic growth and so on. So it's really understanding that basic science and access to research data is important for the whole society. And this, of course, then relates to the discussion on access when it comes to uh, SMEs and other companies. So let me then turn to the activities uh, uh, at uh, my organization, Nordforsk. Uh, I, I already told you that there has been strong uh, activities on uh, research when it comes to using ICT tools, e-science research, also on education and also in uh, infrastructure in the different Nordic countries. And all of these efforts are, of course, then also taking part in the European efforts and global efforts. They are related to, to what was discussed earlier. There is also a history on collaborative efforts. 
So uh, entities collaborate over this, these national borders and that has been taken up by the Council of Ministers. So under the Nordic Council of Ministers two plans for actions on e-science and e-infrastructure have, have been produced. Uh, the latest one, the Nordic e-science action plan 2.0, it was presented in February this year and it has a very strong focus on open science. And this is also done in an international context, so it's really trying to take uh, uh, into account that, for example, the European initi initiatives. So what do we do then? Well, Nordforsk is a body that uh, works with common pot uh, funding. So uh, there is some joint Nordic funding and there is uh, then funding attracted from the different countries to a true common pot. So it's like a joint programming initiative. And all Nordforsk efforts are structured in this way. Uh, the initiative on research on tools, ICT tools and uh, uh, mechanisms, that's the NEGI initiative where I'm the director, we have piloted aspects of open science in calls, call for proposals on development of e-science e e tools and techniques. And then we have, of course, taken a starting point in the, uh, in the um, open data pilot from the Commission, but we have also taken further steps to include uh, open access to software, open access to methods, educational resources and so on. And we will then also evaluate this in, in the um, coming evaluations. The e-infrastructure collaboration at the Nordic level, NAIC, uh, they consist of the different e-infrastructure platforms or providers in the countries. So it's a collaborative effort. They take part in the uh, European uh, projects on an individual basis and they will of course then also apply to, to this uh, calls that we heard coming up. Uh, they are developing jointly services for access to, to digital resources and they will continue to do that. Uh, so this is a starting point. Also Nordforsk in the strategy for the coming years has pointed to that we should ensure open access in all our activities. So more concretely, uh, we will do a couple of things and I will focus on the last one, the red one here. So one thing that has now been decided is that we will add aspects of open science to some existing Nordforsk programs uh, and we'll also fund this. Uh, and I will take two examples. So this has not then been decided which programs we will go further into, but uh, two Possibilities are the programs on societal security and uh, the program on, on Arctic research. And Nordforsk here has an advantage. It's a small entity. Uh, it's governed by the national research funding organizations. So they can sort of use this as a playground. You can try out things, for example, open science. When it comes to societal security, uh, of course, the data that's generated in that type of research program can be highly valuable for, for a lot of, of different companies. It could be uh, companies looking into an environment, it could be insurance companies, it could be a lot of, of different usage of this. And the other way around, uh, you also have public data that could be very valuable to bring into that type of research program. The Arctic's well, it's a special story. Uh, data in the Arctic, it's often very diverse. Uh, it's collected by very diverse set of players. Definitely not only researchers, but companies and a lot of other actors. It's often extremely expensive to get hold of. It's an extremely spar sparsely populated area. So it's like... A, 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 testing field also for the ideas of open science. So these are areas where you think that, that, where we think that this might have some great opportunities. 
And of course, there are strong interests of also uh, commercial activities and uh, different types of uh, companies in the Arctic. Huge natural resources, maybe huge possibilities. So I will stop then by saying, uh, trying to convey some main messages here. So we have identified areas that are of major interest for future development of, of the Nordic region where we can use ICT tools and open science to push the development. And these efforts we think then or we see that they can really result in new research, of course, that's what we are doing at Nordforsk, but also innovation and possibly new public services. For example, data from the, uh, the uh, societal security program. We are trying now to pilot this. And we see that the data sets and the, the tools that we have done to, to integrate here come from very many different actors. Uh, they are highly unstructured, often, and they are um, maybe not of the sense, in the sense of big data data. They might be quite small, small data sets. So we need then to make sure that there are uh, resources and also we have to make sure that the e-infrastructure solutions can adopt to this. And that also relates to the, the presentation we heard just now from, from, uh, from the Commission that of course there is a need of innovation in that system. So thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting example of how public sector research and potentially SMEs can work together after defining some common societal challenges and uh, using the research and the data in order to, to find some uh, creative solutions to this. As you have mentioned, researchers, but not only researchers, need the rewards um, in order to open up their data and uh, in this way we will pass to the next presentation to uh, Mr. Gert Franke from Clever Franke, the a company design agency who will um, uh, tell us about the re rewards that the regional authorities and the SMEs have gained through their assistance for using uh, open data. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm co-founder of Clave Funke and uh, we are a company working with a lot of uh, open data and I want to uh, show you uh, a few of our uh, examples of projects we did and share some experiences uh, we had with those projects. Um, but first of all I would like to tell you a little bit more about data visualization, what we what we are known for. And to start that off, I want to tell you what data visualization is. And uh, perhaps you can help me because I would like you to stand up, all of you. So if everybody could stand up. We also have to stand up. <laughs> and what we basically will try to do is create the largest human data visualization ever created in Latvia. So you, will, you are then now part of that visualization. And just imagine that you're all a bar of a bar chart. And we're now one big three-dimensional bar chart. And now I want you to look around and determine what the highest bar is in this tremendously uh, uh, big uh, three-dimensional bar chart. And perhaps you will uh, notice that, that it's a little bit hard to determine, but if I now ask to, uh, uh, if everybody who thinks is not the tallest to sit down, so, <laughs> then, so we add a little bit of interactivity here and it gets a lot easier. So there are a few guys left, but guys, I'm almost two meters, so eventually I think I will win. So you may sit down as well, because we as, a, as Dutchies all are quite good at these kind of competitions. Um, 
But this is just a small example of what we normally do as a company because we are specialized in creating interactive data visualization. And that's what we do for companies such as Google, Philips, Elsevier, and Wired. And for those clients, we always try to um, show the world from a different perspective by which people can perceive the world around them in a different way. Um, and that's what we do with a team of 15 persons. And today I will show you um, an example of what, you can, what, what we've done with open data. But before I do that, I'll show you an example of uh, a project by which we would have liked to use open data, but eventually we didn't. And that's a small project we did during the coronation of our king. Um, he was uh, crowned king in 2013, and we thought together with a few companies that it would be pretty cool to give people a tool by which uh, we visualized how busy certain places of Amsterdam were during that day. So this was a live visualization of the crowd, which you could access via a website and an app. Um, Therefore, we used capacity maps of Amsterdam by which we could determine how many people could stand on a specific place in Amsterdam. But on the other hand, we also needed data by which we could determine how many people there really were at that moment. So um, we asked the government, like, okay, guys, you have to track the crowd in some way. Can you provide us this data? And unfortunately, due to all kinds of arguments, they couldn't deliver us that data. Um, in the end, we've um, a partnered with one of the mobile network operators which could provide us cell phone data by which we could determine how busy specific places of Amsterdam were. Um, and therefore, we could deliver the audience in Amsterdam that day a tool by which they could see if they would, get, would like to get into the crowd or avoid the crowd. Um, this website, which was part of it, uh, reached in this way 250,000 people in one day. So it had effect, but it was all eventually done by companies working together creating a solution like this. Um, a solution for which we used a lot of uh, open data is uh, one of our la latest projects we did for uh, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Um, they came to us and they asked, like, guys, we need some kind of website or tool in which we could show the current state of our infrastructure. Because our city is growing from 8 to 12 million people in the coming 25 years. Besides that, we're the most important transport hub in, Chicago, uh, in America. So a lot of cargo throughout America goes via uh, Chicago. And, by the way, we have a tremendous lot of overdue maintenance on all our bridges, roads, etc. Um, that makes it really important that we quickly change something. And if we quickly want to change something, we have to have more money to invest in our infrastructure. But this was... Um, this is quite difficult because, like many people, also the Americans don't really like paying taxes. And Eventually, there were new uh, uh, extra taxes needed to fund new infrastructure projects. But we thought, like, okay, interesting project. Let's fly over to uh, Chicago, have a, a few workshops there, uh, together with the guys over there, determine what the project goals should be, and uh, have interviews with stakeholders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But besides talking to all the managers and, and guys over there, we also started investigating what kind of data they had available. Because based on the uh, uh, available data, we could figure out, like, OK, what kind of stories can we tell and, and what can we bring across? But what we also did together with their analysts and statistical people, we um, uh, figured out if we could use also data which was not yet open, but was by which we could tell an even more intriguing and interesting story. And eventually we therefore uh, um, used a lot of data which wasn't open in that, uh, until that moment and also cleaned a lot of data which was needed uh, to use in the visualizations we wanted to create. 
because on the other hand, we also created a lot of um, uh, 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 prototypes by which we could also see what was achievable. Eventually, that led to this website by which you see a bird eye view of uh, Chicago and you see the uh, roads and railroads highlighted. As a short introduction and then we dive into specific subjects like, for example, congestion, which you could see at several places in Chicago, um, how much traffic jams there are during the day. What we also did to make it a little bit more tangible, we created a lot of time-lapse videos um, uh, by which it was also clear where we were talking about. So uh, we, shot, uh, broken, we made shots of broken roads and, and stuff like that. Um, so again, to just give you a small idea, we had a, a homepage. We had three main topics called roads, freight, and transit. And for those three main topics, we made eight data visualizations by which people could zoom in to their specific neighborhoods and figure out what the current state of the infrastructure in their area was. Um, and then we thought like, okay, um, we're really curious what will now happen with this website. We, 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 put in an awful lot of work to create something beautiful and by which we thought like, okay, this is something by which you can start a discussion. And on a Monday in January this year, the website went live and luckily enough, that evening we got an email with a link to this report. And I just want to briefly show this to you to get an idea of what the response was on the website. Drivers in the Chicago area know all about waiting and wasting time. Our roads, bridges, and railway, railways rather are tens of billions of dollars behind on repairs. But the biggest complaint, Dawn, is that nothing is being done about it. That's exactly why the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning created this website. It takes tons of government data and makes it easy to digest so the public can push for action. Take mass transit, for example. We push it. Ridership, we push that, is at capacity at certain times on a number of lines. This interactive map shows how many people are boarding the CTA every day. You see that? More than 700,000. And then take the blue line to O'Hare, for instance. Nearly 10,000 people board at the airport every day. And here it is right here on the map. Our Mike Flannery used this tool to dig into the problems with our railways and railroad crossings. The Chicago area. Okay, th this goes on for another 10 minutes, and I, I just have 10 minutes. So. Um, but the uh, uh, website got a lot of media attention. Uh, the major newspapers in America were writing about it. It was on the front of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, many TV reports were made about this website. And therefore, we achieved the goal we had in mind to start the uh, 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 general discussion about, okay, guys, what should we do with our infrastructure? Um, and I also think this is an interesting uh, example of how you can uh, um, show people what you could do with policy and with policy making and let the general uh, public become part of a discussion about what we should do with several topics. Uh, like, for example, here, in this case, uh, infrastructure. Um, but we couldn't have created this website without a close collaboration with the CMAP team. Um, if those analysts weren't willing to think along with us, with, okay, guys, how can we tell the right story and provide us with the right uh, data, then we couldn't have created this whole uh, website and experience as it currently is. So therefore, to conclude my uh, uh, presentation also is please do not only open data, but keep focusing also on the effect open data can have. And if possible, help SMEs to gather the right data to solve the problems they want to solve. Um, and yeah, that's basically my presentation. And thank you very much for uh, being here. Thank you very much. We are not only the, the tallest in the room, I think it's a, a really fresh eye at the WIRE conference. And I really hope that there are some representatives of regional authorities right now in the room that can see uh, what they can achieve 
uh, it is really an intriguing project and I, I really, really hope that it can serve as an example for other regions as well. Uh, at this point, I would like to open up the discussion. Um, we still have uh, 15 minutes, so I will start uh, with uh, Professor Iveta Gudakowska. Uh, during your presentation, you did mention um, uh, the plan for combining repositories in a national portal. So this is uh, a very interesting idea, so if you want to share the ideas and elaborate a little bit on this. Thank you for a question. I think it is a great idea, but only idea. But I mentioned about scientific portal. It's a real idea uh, moved from our ministry and responsible for our ministry. I think it will come because uh, this idea is in process. Um, I want to add about this this idea in philosophical aspect because I as a representative of library and open air always for openness uh, everything I think is necessary to be open uh, not only for science but for business it, it is a basis of innovation for um, well-being of our society, we need open all data for, for health, for environment, and etc. I think uh, we need think ideas not only about scientific portal, but about infrastructure in total. And, and uh, this idea about possibility, possibility to, to create some uh, infrastructure, it is, I think it is uh, what we need. Thank you very much. I don't know if someone wants to add something on, on this. So I will pass to Mrs. Kalfin. Uh, this morning we had a vivid discussion about the synergies uh, between the structural funds and the Horizon 2020, and I think that it has been clear that um, these synergies are strongly encouraged, although uh, the focus of the different instruments can be diverse. So it is encouraged, but it depends also on the final objective of uh, each instrument and the, each policy. So could we have a comment from your part on this in view of the future calls and uh, just uh, a quick feedback we have heard from, uh, from the speakers that they, they do intend to apply. So a comment on the interregional collaboration and how you see this. Thank you for your question. I'm really happy that my presentation raised uh, such interest immediate for uh, application. Uh, uh, that's true. Uh, we're looking for synergies between Horizon 2020 and structural funds, and we have uh, done uh, a review of a budget allocated for uh, thematic objectives one and two of the operational programs for 2014-20. And uh, what we found out, for example, is that uh, the region with the highest amount, uh, Andalusia, uh, in, from that region we do not have uh, a single representative in uh, the consortia uh, from the projects uh, of Horizon 2020 which already have been submitted and evaluated. Uh, so, uh, looking for such cohesion is uh, really uh, important for us, so we are doing that systematically and uh, we, we really believe that this is the way to go forward, especially in the time of scarce resources and uh, so high quality uh, projects which we receive uh, as a reply to our calls for proposals. It uh, will facilitate also uh, our work in uh, the next period uh, uh, after work program 1617 uh, because as I have mentioned in my presentation uh, about uh, service life cycle management providing that uh, some of the proposals are really of high quality 
and uh, they represent services which are recognized by the scientific society and uh, they are valuable and uh, mature enough. Uh, but uh, there are not enough funding for such proposals. Uh, the way to look forward and to uh, materialize uh, these ideas would be to look uh, uh, for financing through structural funds. So yes, this synergy is very important for us and we are very serious about looking for, for that way forward. Thank you very much. I think that it is very important, uh, not only the fact that uh, this synergy is encouraged, but also the fact that it is monitored. So keeping an eye on what's going on and why it is not happening, since we all agree that synergies are very important, I think that uh, it is something that we should uh, really look uh, on. Uh, I will pass to uh, Mr. Holmgren. So, during your presentation, you gave an excellent example of the interregional collaboration in the Nordic countries on uh, open data and open access policies. So, uh, a question would be whether there are any initiatives to harmonize uh, the policies at regional and national level on open access and open data. Whether there is um, an harmonization policy or uh, how you deal with this? So, of course, this is a, a critical question in a sense. Uh, and uh, when it comes to research data, data coming out of research, the governance in the end sits a lot in the research communities and in the research world as such. And that's a global community. So, if there is eventually a, a movement towards open science in the research area, it will be harmonized eventually, globally, but it will take time. And of course, we can try to push that in, in different ways. Um, what we practically have done uh, at the Nordic level at Nordforsk is, a first step is that if you are thinking about some sort of harmonization, you first need to know what is there to harmonize. So you need to be informed of what are the policies and the structures in the different countries. So we have a process, we have workshops where we make sure that there is communication between the different actors, the different uh, research funders, that's the first step, uh, and also make sure that the um, initiatives at the European area are really discussed in that context. So for example, we have had a workshop where we had representatives of the different research councils, some other actors, and European Commission. And then uh, Nordforsk as such, it's a small actor. I already indicated that what we can do in this area is to be a test bed in a sense. Uh, it, it, it would then be a collaboration between the different uh, research funders at the Nordic level where they try out new schemes for open science and open access and find out what works fine, what works uh, not so fine. And eventually, maybe among each other, come to a conclusion that we want to do this in the same way. But it, it is a process that does not happen overnight. Okay, this is uh, indeed a long uh, process, but the important thing is uh, the common definition as uh, you say, of, uh, of the topic and the start of the communication. So I will pass to, to the last speaker, to Mr. Franke. And um, I think that you have a very interesting double role because on the one hand you are an uh, SME that helps other SMEs or regional authorities to utilize open data and uh, improve their services and their products, but on the other hand, you are an SME and a very successful SME yourself. So, um, a question would be, um, which is the main challenge for um, an SME to work in uh, such a cutting-edge field like open data? And uh, another question just to, to relate with uh, the, the morning session, I would say. Uh, I have seen that among your uh, clients, there are some very impressive uh, clients like uh, Google or Philips. So 
I think that it's quite a success for a European SME to work with uh, this clientele. And I was just wondering whether uh, you have already used some of the instruments that have been presented so far from the structural funds or the framework programs as an innovative company to establish your strategy and uh, to develop uh, your business plan. Um, yeah, uh, as, you, as you have seen, we are just with a team of 15. Um, and if we want to make use of those structural funds, I think we may scale up the organization with at least two more persons. Uh, because we simply don't have the time. And uh, what we try to do as an organization is to have these huge uh, uh, clients uh, which uh, pay our uh, bills. And on the other hand, use that money also to innovate internally a lot. We do a lot of internal projects um, by which we can show clients what we can do. Um, so yeah, we, we are creating our own fund in some way. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think that we don't uh, have any time for question except if there is a a very urgent question that somebody would like to share with us. No, so I take the opportunity first of all to thank all the speakers for their contribution and to make an important announcement uh, from the part of the organizers about the gala dinner tonight. Uh, I just remind you that the dinner is at 8 o'clock. You can find in your badge a map where you can see where the gala dinner takes place. The door opens at 7.30 the dinner starts at 8 o'clock. Thank you very much.